What is going on, everyone? It's Rob and Johnny. Welcome to episode 35 of the MM Arcade podcast. Rob, what is going on, brother? I'm in a new setup. Can you see? It's not as fancy. You are, I'm you, upset. you are, dude. I think, you know what it reminds me of? It's like how far we have fallen, right? You are, like, look at my gorgeous background I and know. my setup. And yeah. look at yours. It's like now the shoe is on the other foot. Remember when it we is. first started? I had like a cardboard box in the background <laughs> or something like that. It's like now, yeah. Now I'm oh, now I'm the guy, you know. <laughs> you are, but there's not much I can do because it's a cupboard here. So what else can I put in front of it if it needs to open? Still, it's a it's a bit heartbreaking. <laughs> only, only open the left side of it, right? Good point. So I that, could take the doors off and shelving. just like fill it with merch or something like that. Yeah, I've got some ideas, but we are no, here. No, hundred percent. You you should um definitely put up some stickers or something, right? Maybe, Maybe my like kids can draw you some pictures. <laughs> S- send me some pictures from your kit. That'd be awesome. And then I'll, we'll hang you, up in the background. Underneath your windowsill there, you can put like a, a shelf there or something like that and have your have your YouTube trophy and the, the, yeah. the helmets and all your other jazz on there. Well, here's the thing. One day, Rob, we're going to have one of those for our channel. When we reach mm-hmm. 100,000 mm-hmm. subscribers, mm-hmm. there will be one of those for MMRK and it, for sure. And it is going up. So I want to say thank you to all our subscribers and listeners yeah. that jump in and hit the, the sub button because uh, yeah. that's the dream. I want to get one of those silver shiny plucks. And, 100%. And uh, Johnny wants two of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I absolutely do. <laughs> yeah, man. So, yeah, thank but, you very much to all you guys. Yeah. And here's the thing, Rob. Today's actually a pretty special mm-hmm. episode for it a number a of different one. reasons, right? First of all, just the other day, we reached one year on the podcast. Our very first episode went up a few days ago, a year ago. So that's really? pretty exciting. It's crazy to think that we've been doing this for a year. Um, but second of all, as well, today we have our very first official sponsorship on the MMRK podcast. And Rob, when we received this, I messaged you and I was like, I don't think there is a more perfect fit for our very first sponsorship for the channel. So Amazon Prime has actually reached out to us and we're going to be working with them on a sponsorship for their upcoming Roadhouse movie starring Jake Gyllenhaal and Conor McGregor. So they've sponsored us for the release of Roadhouse. It is coming to Prime Video on the 22nd of March. I believe by the time this video goes live, it will be the 22nd, so you can check it out on Prime Video. So I'll give Mm -hmm. a bit of a description of the movie in this adrenaline-fueled reimagining of the 80s cult classic Ex-UFC fighter Dalton, who is played by Jake Gyllenhaal, takes a job as a bouncer at a Florida Keys roadhouse only to discover that the paradise is not all that it seems. So, Rob, you and I have watched the movie. You know, we we gave a bit of a watch. Again, thank Mm -hmm. you so much to Amazon Prime for sponsoring us and for supporting the podcast. But, Rob, what did you think of Roadhouse? Yeah, I thought it was cool in – so, firstly, the scene, the UFC scenes, I think the commitment to to – to jumping in with the UFC, to actually having him make weight, weigh in, and yeah. then jump in the octagon. Fun fact, I fought on that card when he went out, walked out, and you did were. the scene. That Yeah, that was, wasn't the best card for me, but good card for him though, <laughs> <laughs> right? But it, but it was cool to see that commitment. And obviously the fans and everybody at the time mm. went crazy because uh, I, I can remember the response. Now – I thought it was it was weird to watch Conor McGregor in the film, right? <laughs> yeah. And I say this, and we were talking about it beforehand because he's not really acting. He's just doing what he does normally day to day. That's yeah, just how yeah. he acts when when he's um when he's doing his press conference or his, his post press conferences or his weigh ins. That's just like how he conducts himself. So I yeah. thought that was that was like a cool little tidbit they put in now yeah. um i was speaking to my wife and i told we were, we were talking about this before the before the cast as well me personally i'm not a massive fan of fight films like i'm i'm just it's just something i've never been into I, and it's funny because i obviously i fight for a living so you'd think that i would enjoy them a little more mm. but in saying that i still enjoyed this movie because I felt like the story drove it and it had some comedy and funny moments in there that mm-hmm. really ticked boxes for me. You know, it wasn't just a, oh, this is the biggest villain, let's go bash him sort of film. You know, it yeah. was really story driven. And uh, you know what? As someone who doesn't normally like watching fight films, this kept me watching. Mm-hmm. That, that was by far my biggest takeaway from the film in that 
it's not just a fight movie. There are the fight scenes, but there's also comedy. There's also serious storytelling. Mm -hmm. And especially when it deals with Jake's character, he, he's essentially haunted. And I don't want to give away any spoilers because we want you to watch it yourself, but mm -hmm. he's haunted a little bit by his past as a UFC fighter. You'll see that teased out, especially in those scenes that Rob talked about where they filmed it at UFC 285, I believe. So that was really cool to see. I thoroughly enjoyed it from start to bit, start to end especially some of the fight scenes and how they mix in the comedy with that. Mm -hmm. They get so awesome, especially the last fight scene. I won't say anything. It is just great. So if you can go watch uh, on Prime Video, go watch Roadhouse. Again, it's out on the 22nd of March. We do want to thank uh, Amazon Prime for sponsoring us and supporting us on the podcast. But it's exciting, Rob. It's exciting to to start getting sponsorships and then companies supporting the podcast and the channel. I know. Our very first you one. New Horizons, like number one. This is uh, I, th I think I think we can success. Like we can finally say we made it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I, um, I think so too. <laughs> so uh, no, I'm very I'm very happy, especially because just how how much of a fit this this, this film was uh, with, yeah. with our podcast and obviously me fighting in the UFC. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it was literally perfect. And I, I loved seeing cameos as well from Post Malone. I love Post Malone's music. So when I saw him in there, I'm like, ah, oh, that's great. And the introduct uh, introduction of Dalton's character, it's just the perfect way of saying how much of a badass and how awesome of a fighter this guy actually is. So go watch it yourself. It's on Prime Definitely. Video. I, th I think that, I think the scene you're talking about with Post Malone, I think, yeah. and, and the introduction of Dalton, I think that really sets the narrative of the story that mm. separates it from its from the first roadhouse like yeah. like it it really wanted to to set a stage saying hey this is like there are themes of the same of of, of the movie but it is very much like its own narrative and it, yeah. it drives the story in its own way and yeah like yeah i enjoyed it i enjoyed it it could have easily done something else. It could have been like just like a huge fight scene and showed how mm -hmm. awesome he was at fighting. But they didn't quite do that. And I don't want to spoil it, as I said. Just go watch the movie. It's awesome. Thank you so much to Prime Video for supporting us on the podcast. But Rob, we have so much to talk about in the UFC world. And even though there wasn't like a big, big fight card on the weekend, we still want to talk about the latest fight night. So mm -hmm. Marcin Tybora actually defeated Tai Tuavasa in round one by rear naked choke. Rob, did you catch the fight and what did you think of it? I did. And I thought Ty was doing really well. I think mm. like I thought Tybora definitely had respect for Ty's punches and yeah. Ty was – I don't know if he was landing the shots or if he was just getting real close with those uppercuts and knowing that Tybura was looking for that takedown threat. I yeah. think the exchange on the fence when Tybura did eventually shoot and, and, and push that wrestling and Ty's defense of it was well until he tried punching him while instead of defending. I think yeah. I think that no one – I don't know. I don't know. I think that one decision – may have let Tybura get those grips, finish the takedown. Yeah. But mate, what do you what do you do? Like these guys, these are these are big 250 pound guys. And I can't imagine how hard it would be to try and get up. Yeah. Unless you're Derek Lewis, right? <laughs> to just get up. Um when you've got like a 250 guy pound dude that knows what he's doing in terms of wrestling and grappling. Yeah. I was um, um I was disappointed a little bit only because I thought Ty could have done better. And it's easy saying that someone is not a fighter. Oh, I thought you could have done better trying to get out the out of the choke and he gave mm. up his back. But especially in that division, now when there are, like you look at Cyril Garn, you look at Volkov, you look at Ty Bora, all of which of people had now Ty has lost to, I thought he'd be putting a little bit more effort in the ground game into trying to get out of those situations. But if you actually look at what he did, he just sunk himself further into the rear naked choke and that was all she wrote. It's almost as if he had no answer for getting out of that spot. Hmm. I do know he worked a lot of wrestling this camp. Yeah. But like, I think wrestling's only half the equation. I do think you need a big chunk of jiu-jitsu in there as well just to be able yeah. to survive those places. Um, and I think what we're seeing is that the higher – you rise, you know, the higher caliber 
fighters you are going to be facing. And mm. at the highest level, these guys can do it all. They can grapple, they can wrestle, they can strike. You know, they can mm. avoid strikes. And you really need to cover your bases because the moment you don't, you're going to get – it's going to get taken advantage of. Mm. But like I said, I liked – I'm upset for Ty because I think he he did look good. I think he wasn't really given the the stage to shine in that fight. Mm. But mate, where does Ty go from here? That that was what I was going to ask you, man. Because he's now four losses on the trot. Um, to be fair on him, there were some pretty big names. But there's some pretty big names because what two years ago he was ranked fifth in the heavyweight division. Mm. So he had to fight th- those caliber of fighters. Again, Cyril Gahn, Pavlovich as well, he lost to Volkov and now Tybora. I don't know what you do with Ty. Um, maybe, maybe, what is Derek Lewis doing now at the moment? Because Derek just lost to Almeida. Um, they, Ty and Lewis have already fought, but. I know, but they fought like five or six fights ago. Like who else do they fight? But Both of them in that situation. Who mm. else do you put them against? You know what I mean? Yeah. Wait, like where's, you, 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 where's, where's, where's Almeida and Blade ranked? Alme- I am going to say Almeida. You, you, you know what? I don't want to see any of those dudes fight Ty. <laughs> no, 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 no. Do you really want to see Almeida fight Ty? Because all he's going to do is smother him for three rounds. No, no sir, way. No, sir. no way. So I'm looking at know. the rankings now, right? Um, we've got where is Blades? Blades is fifth, but I would say Blades is now, you know, he shouldn't be fighting anyone like Ty. I would say mm. Ty Bora should probably fight Almeida. I think that's a good one. Mm. Um, I don't know who... You, all I can see is either Rosenstroke or, or Derek Lewis. Those are I'm seeing as the best opponents. Well, what, what ranked... Where's Rosenstroke? He's 11 at the moment. See, I, I, don't, I don't hate that fight for Ty. I don't hate yeah. that fight at all. I think yep. that's a good matchup, to be honest. I think, I think Ty had more to give in his last fight. He just wasn't given the opportunity to do it. Mm. You know, I, you know, I'm I'm gutted for him because of that. But again, because uh, I'm going to get blasted in comments, I am being biased. I like Ty a lot. Okay, <laughs> congratulations to Tybura. Ty's a yeah. dangerous guy, and Tybura did what he needed to do to to get the W. I'm biased. I'm sorry. I'm friends with him. I like. I like You're friends him. with him. He's Aussie. <laughs> like it's understandable, man. Honestly. Yeah. So um. Yeah, you know it. It's a harsh mistress, man. This game is hard. This game is hard, and it's not for everyone. Um, yeah. It is for Ty though, and yeah. like I said, I just don't think he was given the platform to really showcase what he's been working on. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I I just want to see him get back in there and, and do it again. Well, let's see what happens with Ty. Hopefully, he does get another fight sometime, let's even say later this year. But moving on, Rob, we've got a bunch of other UFC news to talk about. One of the biggest pieces of news in the past week, UFC 301's fight card is coming together slowly. Apparently, they're still Mm. potentially working on a co-main for that event and that card. But we do have Alexandra uh, Pantoja against Steve Ersig, the other Aussie for the flyweight title. We've also got the return, the unretiring, if you will, of Jose Aldo against Jonathan Martinez. We've also got Paul Craig against Kao Barayo, uh, Anthony Smith against Vidor Petrino, Michael Pereira against Mahmoud Muradov. So a few people fighting, also Joaquin Silva against Drakkar Close. Rob, what do you think of this card? What do you think of the main event? And even Jose Aldo unretiring. Well, I want to say congratulations to Steve Ozek to, yeah. to, yeah. to get that fight, man, for, for you know, another Aussie guy to, to get up there. And, man, he's fighting for a title. It's crazy. And I think a lot of people are going to be saying it's crazy because of just how many fights he's had in the UFC and how fast yeah. he's gone through the rankings. But this is what I always say about the UFC. It's just rife with opportunity. You just need to be in the right place at the right time and say yes to fights. And yeah. Steve's done that. He His first fight in the UFC – was a top 10 guy. And then he just kept plowing on from there. Won his last fight in impressive fashion, ready mm-hmm. to do it again. And now he's fighting for the title. That is unbelievable. That is an unbelievable story. And, mate, looking at it skill set wise, I said could be the next champion, man. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's an interesting one because I know a lot of people were surprised by it. And don't get me wrong. I, it wasn't the first fight that I thought was going to get made for that division and, you know, Pantoja's next opponent. But when you look at the rankings, how many people have Pantoja already ran through or mm-hmm. 
someone's injured or they just fought or another situation. When you consider all of that in context, it actually makes a little bit of sense that Ursig is in that position. Um, mm-hmm. So good on him, man. Honestly, I, I think it's going to be a good fight. Yeah, no. And like I said, I think skill set wise, he has what it takes. Yeah. Like he could be the next crowned flyweight champion. What do you think, though, about Aldo returning? Mate, I don't want to see him return. Like, <laughs> I don't. When saying that, he's like, he's not that old. He's 37, sure he's I like, think. Like, is he? I think he's mm-hmm. younger. You no, sure? I, I'm pretty sure he's 36, 37. Hold up. I'll find out now. We're Googling stuff okay. on the on the go. He's 37 years floor. old, born in 1986. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, mate, I feel like he's done enough in the game. I don't know why he's. Of course he has. I don't know why he's coming back, but I feel like he's done enough. Yeah, I feel like he's done enough. I, I don't know. I don't like the idea of taking some time off, retiring, mm. turning off that part of your mind, and then coming back to the game at 37. I'm going to give a bit of speculation, and this is nothing crazy to say, but I think it's obvious that the UFC have thrown a bunch of money at him. The fact is... You, 301 is taking place in, in Brazil, right? That's the, mm. yep. um, where is it taking place? So it's taking place in Rio de Janeiro. I was going to assume that it was probably meant to be Pereira against Hill at that event and they brought it forward because they didn't have any other fights to take place as the main event 300. at 300, right? So if you had Pereira, if you had Pentoja, then that card's looking a little bit more beefy. But with Pereira fighting on 300, they kind of had to bring back someone with some sort of star power and Jose mm-hmm. Aldo could be that guy. So I get it. He was probably given a bunch of money, but what is this going to mean? Like, is he going to keep fighting? Is this a one and done? Yeah. It doesn't make sense to me in that way. It, Yeah, it it doesn't. And uh, I can see where you're coming from that and I like it. I, I, I like that theory. I think that makes perfect sense. Mm. But, mate, I don't know. I I. I don't know. Maybe he comes back though and puts on the best performance of his career. And I hope we see that because like I'm a fan of Aldo, to be honest, you know. But yeah. I've never I'm I'm never really a fan of guys retiring and coming back. I'm yeah. I'm not a fan of it. I feel like especially in the craft that we do, you need that part of your brain primed and ready and then when you retire you switch it off, it's gone and your instincts and everything, your body knows it's done. And it's like, okay, we can chill out now. And your body starts to revert to being normal again. Yeah. I mean, we've just talked about this recently with the likes of Cejudo, right? I mean, look at his return. Mm-hmm. He had two losses against some very, very hard opponents. It, I, I'm not going to say that, that it mars their legacy or that it could mar Jose Aldo's legacy if he loses. Like, his legacy is what it is. But, but it, yeah. It does, on. Yeah. <laughs> but it does. Like, There's a question that is asked at the very least. At the yeah, very least. Like if you look at Anderson Silva's legacy mm. and then you look at GSP's legacy, that's like Anderson Silva marred his legacy by taking those fights at the end of his career. Um, Fair. Not by much, okay? Mm. Granted, he's still one of the best to have ever done it and his reign through the middleweight division was ridiculous. Mm. But mm. it just doesn't. It's not the same. It's not the same. Yeah. But th- that being said, that's us assuming that Aldo loses, right? He could yeah. actually win. I don't know. It's going to be a pretty hard matchup for mm-hmm, him. Mm-hmm. But if he wins, he could go out on a high, especially in Brazil. It'd be a really cool moment for him. Yeah. But if he doesn't, we could all just viewed this as a, as, as a one and done and they have a cool fight to, to have in Brazil for three or one. You, you, you know yeah. what? And I, I hope that, you know, your theory is true that they mm. threw Aldo a bunch of cash because I want to see Aldo make a bunch of money. So if yeah. they threw a ton of cash at him, I'm I'm happy for that because then he's making a big buck. Obviously, he's like he he's still a fighter. Like he can he can fight the the best of them. I'm just mm. just voicing my fears about retiring fighters coming back. That's fair. No, that's totally fair, man. But next 
topic we have is uh, actually two different topics about two different weight divisions talking about who they're going to fight next, the champ that is. So this time we've got Islam Makachev saying his next title defense, it's probably going to be against Dustin Poirier. That's who he's asked the UFC to fight. So this is specifically what he said. Quote, I know Dustin does not deserve the title fight. His words, not mine. But we don't have any option right now. Everybody is busy. I want to fight. I want to fight three times this year. I have to call out someone and Poirier is free now. He showed an excellent performance and scored a beautiful knockout. He's free now. He's healthy. And I asked to fight him in June. Apparently as well, he said he wanted to fight someone in March and the UFC said there were no options for him, mm. especially because um, he had like he had Gaethje fighting against Holloway already booked at 300. So Rob, what do you think about Islam calling out Dustin Poirier, even though just Dustin just lost against Gaethje. Yeah, but then he did have a good win against Benoit, right? Um, yeah. I am always up to see Poirier taking title shots. <laughs> like, yeah. I yeah. think, yeah, I'm just always for it. I think, I think, I don't know. I don't know how much you look into it. Like, I think Makachev's looking at Poirier based on like what Khabib did to him. And that Poirier can get held down, and it's like what kind of what happened in the Ben Mar fight as well to a to a to a degree. Yeah. He, he was able to like to utilize that wrestling, bully him up against the fence, and control him that way. But in saying that, Poirier is dangerous. Mm. Like, I think he is such a dangerous fight for people just because he's he's always in it, and it doesn't matter if it's in the first second of the first round, the last no. second of the fifth, he could knock you out. And he has a really good way of like throwing those awkward angles in in tight in the pocket and just landing solid shots like mm. and just switching you off. I don't know. I don't know. I think it's a dangerous fight to take, but then they're, they're all dangerous fights, right? I'm always yeah. happy for Poria to take a fight. So happy for it. <laughs> Dude, the fact is – Whoever Poirier fa- faces, whoever is in that spot as a champ, whether it was mm-hmm. going to be Islam or if you know Islam and Gaethje happened to fight and Gaethje hypothetically won, both of them are going to be hard fights for him, right? I'm just glad that he is getting a title opportunity because he's probably one of, if not the mo- like the best fighter that has never won a title. Like mm-hmm. the amount of high caliber people that Dustin Poirier has beaten and for him to still not have a fully fledged title is disappointing. Yeah. So if he can do it against Makachev, yeah. I'll be a very happy man, but it is going to be a hard Never say never. No, never say never. But Rob, another division, this time it's your division, the middleweight division, Drickus has essentially asked fans who he should be fighting next to defend his middleweight title. He put it out to people and said, should it be a rematch with Sean Strickland or should it be a fight against Izzy? Now, you and I have talked Mm. a lot about, you know, people getting immediate rematches and how it needs to slow down a little Mm. bit. Literally, both of these guys... It would be an immediate rematch um, if Drickus were, were to fight either of them. So, by a number of, uh, of the polls that I see, saw, more people thought Strickland should get the immediate rematch over Izzy. Who do you think mm. Drickus should be fighting next? Uh, I don't know, mate. Me. It's hard. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, call, call me out your bum. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I I I don't I don't know. I don't know. I can see them making that that easy fight because of the bad blood between them because of mm. South Africa and that whole story arc. Um Yeah. Oh yeah, I can't really see UFC getting behind Strickland again. No. Nah. Um, I don't think they loved him as a champ to begin with, so I don't think like they're really gunning for that. Rematch. He's a hard person to promote and get in an interview. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I I don't I don't know. I don't know. I'm kind of hoping Drickus gets easy in a sense just so that I can fight Strickland, right? I think that makes the most sense in all mm. honesty. The fact mm. is, yeah, both of them technically would be a, an immediate rematch to get back to the title. But at yeah. least in the case of Drickus, he hasn't fought Izzy yet. So it's not an immediate rematch against him necessarily, yeah. if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. So but let's I'm, see. I'm probably that. Yeah. 
Let us know in the comments below. I'm genuinely curious what you all think. Should Drickus be fighting Izzy or should he be fighting Sean Strickland? But Rob, that is it this week for all of the UFC news and, and the fights that took place. But now we're going to games news. And by far the biggest piece of games news from this week is that specs for the PS5 Pro have leaked. So this is all from Insider Gaming, by the way. We can't confirm whether it's absolutely real or not. But they're saying that the PS5 Pro is going to have a 28% increase of memory memory over the standard console the cpu is going to be the same but it's going to be clocked a bit higher so apparently a 10 percent increase over the standard console the gpu is going to render 45 percent more than the ps5 apparently two to three times better ray tracing performance um, and support for 8k resolution apparently is going to be planned for a future S sdk version and apparently a detachable drive and one terabyte of storage and all that kind of stuff similar to the current ps5 mm -hmm, mm -hmm, rob mm -hmm. what do you think about the leaked specs for the ps6 uh, ps5 pro i think everyone should save their money and save up for a computer right <laughs> like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, yeah oh man i don't know that's how i feel i feel like if you if you're if you need a, a more powerful console mm. you should have bought a pc to begin with right mm. um because let's face it when the ps5 came out yeah like you didn't need to save that much more money to get a PC. Mm. Like it, the the consoles today, what are, what are they? They're like eight hundred bucks new, are they? Australian, yeah, seven fifty to eight hundred eighty, yeah. Yeah, like they're not cheap, and they, these are consoles we're talking about. Like the the, mm. the the biggest reason people would would buy a console rather than a computer was because it was cheaper, um, by and large. But well, also the convenience factor as, as well, right? Like it's very easy. As much as I love PC gaming, I have two gaming PCs. It can cause many more headaches than just a regular console that you're not building yourself. It's plug and play pretty much. And I will say there's been a lot of talk this week about, you know, games being 30 FPS on the PS5 and da, 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 da. It's not as good performance. Honestly, man, I will go to my PS5 and I'll go back to my gaming PC and I just won't care. I won't care about whether it's 60 FPS or 30 FPS, as long as the game is good, it looks pretty good, I'm having a good time. Mm. So I think this PS5 Pro, it's either for hardcore people that just want a little bit of extra performance out of their PS5, or it's for new people coming into the space that might as well spend another 50, 100, whatever it might be, dollars just to get a PS5 Pro and enjoy the extra performance, you know? Yeah. I don't know. I know you don't feel the I same. Know. I know you don't feel the well, same. Well, no, it's just like <laughs> if you've got a console and you want to spend another... Like spend eight hundred bucks yeah. to just get a little bit more juice out of your console, man. That, like buy a computer, dude. Like, what do you care? It's easier said than dude. done, Rob. Because computer costs can get up there, especially if you're like, oh wait, do I choose this motherboard or that motherboard? How much storage do I really need? What graphics card should I go for? And when I so when I built, and I'll tell everyone this straight up, when I built my PC, my latest PC, it was in smack bang in the middle of COVID, and PC prices were so bloody expensive. I spent almost like nine grand. Australian on that PC. It was ridiculously expensive. Now everything has come down in price, so it's much better. But PC costs can get up there, especially when you consider which you know components that you should be getting. And it's a headache. You know what? It's a headache. Do you know what? Do you yeah. know what, Johnny? Yeah. You're hundred percent right. Yeah. I take back <laughs> all you. my statements I just made. I think <laughs> like consoles consoles do a good job. They do a yeah. good job for the for the amount of money that they for the amount of money you spend to get them. And you don't have to buy accessories. You don't have to buy all the other jazz. And yeah. let's let's face it: like you, if you spend if you spend minimal amounts of money on a PC, it's it's going to get outdated very very fast. Whereas a console kind of holds its value for much longer than a PC. I feel. Hmm. Well, it's um, because developers they know that they're developing for those specific specs for the next yeah. seven to eight years of yeah. games, right? So it's locked. So in. I, I completely retract everything I said at the beginning, and I'm back on the console. <laughs> the console being one of them. Excellent. Well, let's see what happens mm -hmm. with the PS5 Pro if these specs are actually real or if they might change when this thing is announced. Apparently, it could be coming out this year. So let's see what happens with that. But Rob, we are at the 30 minute mark and we are going to be talking about what we're watching, playing, and reading. I think I know what your answer is going to be because you and I have been playing the same game. But Rob, what have you been playing this week? <sighs> Mate, I've just been <laughs> get comfortable everywhere. <laughs> I've just been itching for this 
for this segment, for this part, right? And it's not to take anything away from all the other parts, but of course not. Yeah. My life is consumed right now with Dragon's Dogma Two. Hell yeah! I don't want to be recording right now. I want to be going on adventures with my pawns and just smashing goblins, dude. Like I don't want to. I don't want to train. I don't want to do work. I don't want to do interviews. I don't want to see my kids. I just want <laughs> to play Dragon's Dogma 2. Uh, okay. Now, so for people that don't yeah. know what Dragon's Dogma 2 is, please give them a rundown of it. Oh, mate. It's, it is a traditional fantasy adventure open world RPG. Yeah. Now, and I mean it in a sense that like it is as faithful – to the genre as you can be, to the idea, to the story that Mm. is adventure parties, RPG, fantasy. Mm -hmm. And I commend commend them, Capcom, so much for how they have stuck to their guns. They have stuck to their their goals and their Mm. ideas. And gone through with it now because they there's a lot of things systems in the game that a lot of people are not going to like and I think I don't think this game is going to fit a like a a group of people like it's not going to fit everyone this game because mm. there are things that they could have made easier for ease of access and I think a lot of people are going to be upset that it's not there and the people that aren't upset are going to be happy that it is such as like fast traveling yeah fast traveling is not a thing. You got to run everywhere, dude, and the map is effing huge. <laughs> or you can take ox carts. Ox yeah. carts aren't fast; they're slower they're than so you can slow. run. Yeah. They're slower than you can run, dude. Like, and uh, and you can you can sleep it off, but your map doesn't get uncovered, mm-hmm. and you'll get jumped in the night multiple times. That's just what happens. And then you're fighting at night, and it sucks. Or you can use fairy stones, which are like teleport things. But they cost ten grand a pop. Okay, so it's expensive, man. It's like uh, yeah, you and really, money at the beginning is tight. <laughs> yeah, you got to really weigh like whether or not I'm going to hoof it or if it's worth using those stones. And trust me, ninety percent of the time so far, I've been like, "Stuff it, I'll run." It's like pitch black. There's ghosts chasing me. There's skeletons chasing me. I'm like, "Come on, come on!" Just trying to get my boys to follow me because they're trying to punch on with everything in pitch blackness. Like it's uh. But you see, that's just one. That's just one piece of gaming of 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 technical. Of, of, that's one. Just one aspect of the game that they could have made much easier for ease mm. of access for a mm. newer community base, but they didn't. And I respect them for that. I love yeah. it. I love it. This you can probably hear it. I am frothing on this game. <laughs> It was very funny because um, so we did get the code early. The game comes out on the twenty second. Um, yeah, you Rob was plebs. like, I, I, "Just know, I just know, this. all all of you <laughs> that are listening to this, and you guys have been playing it for a couple of days. I was playing it five days before you. Get that in ya. Get that in ya. <laughs> he was I'm so excited. Oh man! Well, I, 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 this is one of the games. Rob was like, "I'm so excited for Dragon's Dogma 2. So I, I reached out to the distributor for Capcom in Australia. So thank you to them for providing us an early code. In terms of my experience, man, I get that exact same. Of it's very funny because you have to know. I just played Elden Ring, right? Very different game. So coming from Elden Ring, where I was like on edge the whole time, coming to Dragon's Dogma 2. <laughs> I like how it is just this fantasy adventure. You have to become the sovereign and kill the dragon. You've got your party of pawns. You're going on this mystical adventure and adventure. It's just, I love it. It's just, it's how I felt about Skyrim the first time I played Skyrim. And I do like, as you mentioned, that they've stuck to their guns with a lot of the mechanics of this game. For instance, there's no lock on, right? And again, just coming from Elden Ring, that you are able to lock onto your opponent so you know who you're hitting and you know which direction you're rolling or blocking. There's none of that in Dragon's Dogma 2. you got to know at all times your awareness and where enemies are and make sure you're blocking in the right direction or you're swinging your sword or whatever in the right direction. 
I love the ox, ox carts. I don't care how slow they are. I like how they're going along slowly and you can either sit there or go along with your pawns and kill enemies along the way. And you want to do that because there are things that you need to explore and, and, and items to dis- discover. I think the Seeker Stones, I think that's what they're called, Rob. You want to get a bunch of those as well. I just like it, man. I want to play more of it. I don't want to be sitting here doing the podcast either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, you know, it's funny though, because like you said, you came from Elder Ring and you're on Edge, whereas now yeah. you're in an RPG game. The game's pretty, pretty tough. It can be like, yeah, tough in some areas. I feel like, so I think the, the guy, one of the d- developers is, uh, the guy that did Devil, the Devil May Cry series. Mm-hmm. And you can see the combat transfer over in in a sense like it is pretty intuitive it is very fast it's reaction like Mm. and reactivity in the combat is like really top notch in my opinion and i feel like so when i was playing i was a fighter to change the shield like you really have to get used to the character and the role you're playing because like to change the shield direction because there's no lock on Mm. you need you need to get good at that mechanic to be able so you don't just get absolutely stomped on um, yeah, I don't know. Like, whilst I don't feel like it's super hard, I feel like you need to be switched on. Like, I so I try and fight everything I come across first yeah. go, everything. Yeah, and I remember, I remember. So, so right now I'm having. Here's a story. Right now I'm <laughs> having class crisis because I'm a warrior at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And that's a big two handed swing dude, but he's so slow, man, so slow, mm. and I can't tell how much more damage. I'm doing as a warrior opposed to say a sorcerer hypothetically because mm. I've never played as a sorcerer. I, I can't really tell. But remember telling Sphere like, come check this out because there was a big minotaur in the distance. And I was like, I'm going to go punch on with this guy. And I ran in, <laughs> I did my bellow, pulled aggro, started charging up my thing and the minotaur just whacked me and I flew across the screen, ragdolled. And then it took me, <laughs> what, then it took me like a minute to run back and then he kicked me again and I ragdolled again. Like, and it was just, I was just getting thrown around. <laughs> Like, get yeah, like thrown around by these big dudes, and it was upsetting because it's not cool. It's not cool. I'm like this cool dude in heavy armor, with a big two handed sword, but I'm so mm. slow. Yeah, and I get ragdolled by these big ogres and minotaurs. I don't know. I'm thinking about well, playing well, a sorcerer now. That's the thing. Well, here's the thing with your vacation. For those of you that don't know, you can change whenever you want, and in fact, you're actually encouraged to change because. As you play in, in each vocation, what are they called, Rob? They're not called skills. They're called augments. Augments, where when you get those augments, they apply across all your all your vocations and your character as a as a one thing. So yeah. if you want to like play your, as an archer, like your skill stones. Yeah, one hundred percent. So if you are playing as a warrior, and warrior is one of the more advanced vocations, by the way, there's different advanced ones like a mystic spear hand and magic archer that you unlock as you play the game. But the basic ones, initially, if you want to play as an archer or a fighter or a mage or a thief, you can do that. You only need to spend another 100 coin to unlock the vocation that you don't have. So it's very simple and very easy. And I love games that allow you... It, this is not technically mm-hmm. respecking in, in a sense that it is. But if you want to change your vocation, you can. And the game allows you to do that, which is awesome. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, and something I had to look up, but uh, when you level up, depending on what class you are, you receive a certain allocation of stats Mm -hmm. and skills. Yeah. When you change class, it changes class as if you had leveled up to say 20 as if you were a mage or if you switch Mm. to fighter, then same, same, yada, yada, yada. So it, it, you don't have to like, cause straight away when I was like, Oh, I'm thinking about playing sorcerer. I thought about deleting my character. (laughs) <laughs> really? Because <laughs> well, I'm a min-maxer. Like I need, yeah, I need yeah. to know that I'm, I've got the most amount of magic I could yeah. have since the beginning. But- well, the only thing really is, Rob, is that the, some of the armor that you buy and the weapons that you buy, if you're buying specifically for one vocation and you swap, you're kind of starting back from square one. You need to go buy mm. the, or get the, the best armor and best weapons possibly for your character. You know? Yep, yep, yep. I am, I am enjoying the game immensely. Yeah. immensely i think i do think there's going to be a group of people that because there are there are moments in the game where you're like okay what do i do now sort of thing mm. um because it is it really is like a you're in a and i that's why i love it so much because you're in, you're just an adventurer dude like you mm. gotta go find your adventures there's no quest markers there's no billboards there's no bulletin boards there's well, no there is quest markers there is oh 
You haven't been following yeah, but them? It, yeah, no, but there's not a quest marker like where you look, there's a big exclamation mark on an NPC saying, hey, come over here. I've got a quest oh, for Oh, right, it. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? It's more like you overhear some dude saying, hey, these mm-hmm. guys haven't come back from the woods and then yeah. the quest starts. Yeah. But, yeah, you, you, I don't know. I'm really, really enjoying it. Really enjoying it. You know what I haven't tested out yet? Because the game said at one stage that if you accept a quest, be careful. Because if you don't do that quest and time progresses, it can affect things. And I've been really worried. I haven't wanted to mess any quests up. So as soon as I get a quest, I've been finishing it. Mm. Have you tested that out yet to see if you don't do a quest, whether it just ends or if the people lost in the woods die mm. or something like that? No, they, I need to test they that do. out. They do. They 100%. Far out. Out. That's awesome. <laughs> so, but it depends on what quest you're doing. So like, for instance, mm. the, I've gotten quests where the guy's like, hey, Come speak to me in the tavern when you're yep. free. Um, and then I bug it off for days. Right? <laughs> because like he's just waiting for me there. But then if someone comes to me and goes, hey, my my brother's lost in the woods. Yeah, and yeah. I think he's in trouble. You should probably go suss it out quickly. Yeah. I think the one that you're talking about, I think is part of the main story where the guy just sits in the tavern. You can go there when, whenever. And they're not going to... I'm just saying this uh, early, it might be wrong, but I don't think they're going to make the main quest hard to to finish. So you could probably do those quests whenever you want, hopefully. I don't, I don't know. I don't know because because when you speak to him, he gives you a monster culling quest yeah. and his, they've, they've, they have dispatched squads of soldiers to go deal with him. And when I've come across them doing that that quest, they're in the midst of fighting. The enemy. So you reckon they could die if you're too late? I think so. I reckon so. I reckon so. Ooh. Oh, this is going to change how I play the game. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, so like, you know what's cool? It's like, because like I love going out and I do quests and I really push the day's envelope as hard as I can because mm. you can't see anything at night. Friday at night sucks. So yeah. and I also don't want to camp out because then I lose another day of, of travel time. So yeah. I really push it as hard <laughs> as I can. And then, so usually by the time I come back to the city, and I've traveled a million miles, come back a million miles, usually at nighttime, gone back in the city, my health bar is like at half because <laughs> of just all the damage I've taken. Yeah. And like as you, you, the only way to really regenerate all, you lose permanent health based on how long you're out for, yada, yada, yada. Mm. But by the time I get back, I'm ready to sleep, sell my gear, upgrade, maybe take a day off. Like I feel like I've gone on an adventure and I've come back and I'm taking some time off now because that took forever and I don't want to jump into it straight away again. Yeah. And and part of that, I also like as well how you do have to inventory manage. So when you are leaving out of the city to go quest and do whatever, you can't have too much stuff on you because if you want to loot and get more, you're going to be heavy or very hairy, Mm -hmm. heavy, and you're just going to not be able to move properly. You get tired faster. This is a cool game, man. I really enjoy it. Yeah, because like you're like I need at least one camping supplies just in case I get caught out. Yeah, I need heaps of health supplies because I'm I'm like face tanking the entire game <laughs> by, with with my face, dude. So like, ah oh, man, that's so much fun. Are we yeah. done? Can, can I go? <laughs> Look, we we've still got viewer questions. We've got probably another seventeen minutes left on the car, so we can go play Dragon's Dogma two after this. But <laughs> that's pretty much what we've been playing, unless you've been watching or reading anything else, Rob. Uh, I've been reading several books, but nothing of note, to be honest. Nothing Fair. of note. Fair. Uh, watching well, Watch Roadhouse. So there's yep. that, right? We did um, We did watch Roadhouse. I watched that and, two nights ago. So I, I might watch it again. I'm actually in, uh, considering watching it again. I think it's just a fun pop conflict, man, honestly. It's, um, it's not a bad one because you can just kind of brain out to it. You can just like pop it on yeah. and just yeah. chill out. But uh, otherwise, sure. no. Like, before in my immediate future is only Dragon's Dogma. Hell yeah. I think that's the same with me as well. Maybe Rise of the Ronin. That that looks pretty cool too. We'll see if I if I play that. I one. may not pick my kids up from school. You don't understand. <laughs> you don't understand how obsessed I am right now. Oh uh, man, I should never have given you that code. So the last segment is if, viewer if questions. If I would have found out you had the code and did give it to me, dude, I would have booked a ticket to. I would have drove to Melbourne to get you. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta understand, dude. Like, well, it was funny because so, so Rob had the game pre-ordered. Like that's how much he was looking forward to it, and he couldn't activate the code because it said he already owned the game. So he had to get it refunded, and then it was yeah. pretty funny. 
Uh, anyway, oh, viewer questions. If you have a viewer question, let us know in the comments below. But first up, we've got at set it free 78. One for you, Rob. Honestly, which way would you rather lose? Five rounds of getting outclassed or a quicker knockout or submission? And obviously, this is in reference to the last fight with Cheeto and Sean O'Malley. Rob, what's your preference here? Uh, five rounds of getting bashed. Really? Because, um, yeah, you got to go out and shield. Nothing. Okay, nothing's worse than getting knocked out and submitted because, like, you're like, what if? Like, mm. like what I said about Ty's last fight. I feel like he could. He wasn't given the stage to showcase what he had studied, and and that is to Todd Boris's credit. Yeah. Right. But I, I don't know. We're fighters. We got to go out our shields. And I, I'm 99% sure that would be the answer of every other fighter there as well. Yeah, yeah. Next question is from at Preston Winters 9656. Boys, i got to ask, Samurai or Viking for Elden Ring? And I think they need a journal system like in Morrowind for Elden Ring. Rob, you are the class master when it comes to Elden Ring. Mm. Samurai or Viking? Uh, Samurai is much easier. Is because- that because it's like it ties nicely with the bleed build? Exactly. A lot of the katanas yeah. bleed. They're a fast yeah. weapon. Um, mm. you can, they're not too heavy, so you can dual wield them like pretty easily. Mm. And some of the weapon arts for the katana classes are just stupid. Like the rivers yeah. of blood, that katana is just silly. Oh, then there's the magic katana. So like you can yeah. you could be a mage and go samurai, or you could be a bleed arcane samurai, or you could be straight up deck samurai. It's like, yeah, you've got options there. Whereas a Viking, I assume you're just wielding axes. In yeah. armor, and I played a big portion of the game like that. Yeah, for for PVE, it's like it's simple. I think PVE is pretty easy, just generally anyway. But if you want a power trip, then samurai, like, this is your way to go. But if yeah. you want to be cool, dude, if you want to be cool like me, <laughs> yeah, go biking, yeah. man, biking, <laughs> or, or just even better, just walk around the little club. The clubs are best. Yeah. That's all I play with now is a club. So you, you keep saying that, in your experience, Elden Ring is easier. And we all know that you like to play games that punish you. So you're yeah. typically really good at Souls-style games and games that are hard. Um, I was reading, and because I never played Elden Ring at launch, apparently at launch, a number of the bosses, including Radan, I believe it was, were much harder and they had to debuff them and, and turn them down. Is that true? Did they have to do that for Elden Ring? I don't, I don't know. Um, if they did, you know, it makes me sad. But, yeah, like Radan was, Radan was pretty tricky. He's just like, he didn't. But give Radan you a lot of was frames. the one where you could spawn a bunch of people to help you, right? I'm assuming you didn't do that because you say you don't like to use spawns. Um, in that one, no. It depends what. I think I've done it where, like, those are NPC spawns, and Correct. the rule of thumb for me is I spawn NPCs most of the time because. Okay. They usually lock like you need them for quest progression. Dark Souls is tricky, and and actually you do you get extra dialogue yeah. lines, and especially for that one because you get the jar and the jar guy Alexander. is like <laughs> Alexander. That's the yeah. you need to follow his quest line a certain way to get the shard of Alexander when yeah. he's at the Dragon Ruins right at the end, and that's like one of the best talismans you can get. Period, because it increases I think uh, weapon art like skill damage, massive. Okay. Mm. So, um, yeah, so a lot of those NPCs, and there's another one uh, at the Stormwind Castle, that that, that oh, chick yeah. with the, the wind axes, the storm, yeah. storm axes, you know, it, if you don't summon her into that last fight, and if she doesn't survive it, mm. then you can't progress her story. So, uh, I digress. Uh, rule of thumb That's is I crazy, summon the NPCs man. if I can. Like, you, you got to, otherwise you'll probably miss out on stuff. Why, but I don't know if it was like any harder because- us. Yeah, I found I found the game was pretty easy. But then, like as you said, I'm not very I'm not very good at the game, but I'm good at builds. So I'll yeah. I, if you make if you make it like a, a pretty optimized build, you 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 can walk cakewalk a lot of the game for sure. Even if you don't make it optimized, you can just grind out souls and level up to a mm. stupid amount, and then just walk through things. Like max leveled weapons will just walk through most of the game. Yeah, but uh. Yeah, if they were easier, like the only, the only person that I found really hard was Moog, that blood yeah. dude. Like I found him so hard, and that was because I was a warrior at the time. But yeah, so hard. Well, funnily enough, at Mogun Palace is one of the easiest rune farms that you can find. Um, mm. 
I, I'm not going to lie. I, I I use the normal version of it. So there's two versions when you're standing on the, um, it's like a hill of some sort. There are a bunch of enemies there where you can just mm-hmm. kill, get a bunch of runes and then go to the, the thing and then you respawn them. And that's a regular game mechanic. So anyone that does that is fine. But then there's a cheesier version of it where you look to your left and there's a bird and all you need to do is shoot an arrow at the bird. It falls down and it gives you like 17,000 runes if you have all the buffs. Mm-hmm. So I didn't use that one because I thought that one was a little bit unfair. But this game has a surprising number of ways to just really rank up yeah. easily. And then there's the even cheesier version where oh, you course. do some horse <laughs> mechanics and you jump off the map in a certain way where it despawns the map itself and all the enemies fall through the floor and they all die at once and you get a huge stupid chunk of thing and what? then you fast travel back to the bonfire and do it again, rinse and repeat. Are you kidding? That is insane. Nah, that is ridiculous. Like, that is a yeah. that is a glitch though. That is that's not oh, yeah. fair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's pure it's pure cheddar cheese. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But if if you are having problems in Elden Ring, yeah, number one, look up a, uh, a build guide yeah. and you'll be fine. And two, just level up Vigor. Vigor is the most important yeah. thing to get your health up. It's, you'll be fine. It's real simple. If you're having trouble, you just get good. <laughs> Next question is from <laughs> at Falcon. Yeah, love the podcast, guys. When reviewing a card post event, would you ever consider going over the prelims first and then touching on the main event after? This will actually get viewers to watch longer. Just a suggestion. I wanted to include this, Rob, because for people that don't know, like we talk about a lot in our episodes. We've got UFC news, we've got the fights that we just took place, game news, what we're playing, viewer questions. It's hard to cram all of that into an hour if we're covering all the prelims. But what we've also found as well in episodes where we talk about earlier fights first and not the main card, people are just skipping to the main event and that's what they want to see. So it actually hurts our watch time. It's actually detrimental to our episodes. So I just wanted to kind of mention that. That's why we have the structure that we do. You know what I mean? Mm. Also... Mm. Uh, also, I'm not, I'm not a massive fan of mixed martial arts. Like, like when I say not a massive fan, I, I don't mean it in a sense that like I'm not a fan of mixed martial arts. I'm a, I love mixed martial arts. It's what I do. Yeah. But I, I'm not a fan of the sport. As in, I, I don't. Every Sunday, I don't sit down on the couch watching from the fight pass prelims through to the main event. I don't, I don't do mm. that. Like. A lot of the times I may miss the main event and just watch it after the fact just so I can speak on it with you guys because, yeah, I just, I don't know. To be honest, watching fights sometimes give me anxiety. <laughs> like, yeah, you've talked about it's this. Just like, yeah. yeah, and uh, and I, I don't need that on my Sunday sometimes. <laughs> mm. You'd but, rather uh, sit down with a coffee and play Dragon's Dogma 2 for the whole day. Mate, <laughs> now you're getting it. Now you're getting it, right? <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, I, I guess I don't think I can see us doing full card breakdowns like that because I, whilst I do believe we'll get some guys that are more interested in that and, and want to watch it from start to finish because of that reason, we'll also lose some guys because yeah they want to tune in for the main event and then listen to the game of news or they don't aren't interested in UFC at all and they just want to listen to the game of news because yeah, yeah. my game knowledge is top tier. <laughs> that's what they come for <laughs> and and like us in in the podcast space and the youtube space when we first thought of this podcast we had to think of ways to try and offer something special and be unique in our own mm. way because how many ufc channels and mma channels are there that break down every single fight the first one that i can think of is the weasel right when you have people in the space all already doing that very well it's very mm. hard to just come in there and do the same thing and expect to succeed. You kind of have to be a little bit different, which is why we combine MMA with video games and sometimes mm. anime as well. Yeah, so. definitely. It's it's like we'll mean you 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 tune in for me and Johnny's op- uh, opinions on either fights past or fights coming forward yeah. and our tips perhaps, and then you sh- and then we move on to like our passions, like and what mm. what we're doing, what we're playing, and you know our opinions on those. So. Yeah, it's 100%. a very personalized space. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Next question is from at smirch915. Just said nothing on Francis. Obviously refers referring to Nganu losing to Anthony Joshua the other day. Rob, what do you think of that? I, I actually watched recently your Ariel Hawani interview, just went up today and you talked a little bit about it. But what do you think about Nganu's loss? Um mate, I don't know. 
I don't know what to say. I yeah. Uh, because I don't want to just jump on him and shit on the guy because he lost. Yeah. Like, I think he fought one of the best boxers in the world, right? That that it's it's not like that couldn't happen, right? I think mm. that's what we were expecting really when he fought um, Fury. I yeah. think that's what we expected uh, and he that didn't happen. So I think we expected more from him when he fought AJ. I don't know how much you can look into it, to be honest. I don't know. I don't know. Because I know I know now that Francis lost the way that he did, everyone's shitting on him. Everyone is saying, Oh, Fury mustn't have trained for it, yada yada yada. Yeah. And they're just they're just jumping on him. And and the, the sport is cruel for that. The fans are really cruel for that. So I maybe it was an off night. Maybe AJ had an on night. Maybe it was a bit of both. I just uh, I'm more curious, more interested. Opposed to the loss, I'm, I'm less interested in him losing and then more interested in what he's going to do now, how he mm. comes back from this and what that fight looks like. Surely he has to go to the PFL, right? Like there is no better time. The PFL, how many fighters have they announced as part of their roster and they haven't yet fought? And Ghanu is one of them. If he won, I would see an argument of him fighting whoever because it's a huge money fight. But the fact that he lost now, he kind of has to go back and reassess things. At mm -hmm. some stage, he's got to fight with the PFL. So why wouldn't it be now? Mm -hmm. I don't like the idea of him jumping between MMA and boxing. I feel like mm. just like retired fighters, I don't like to come back because I feel like you need a certain amount of commitment to the craft. I do. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, I wish him a swift recovery, yeah. you know, and to, to, to block out the noise because it's cruel, dude. <laughs> Yeah, th this is a guy that before that fight had not only never been knocked out, not only had never been knocked down, but pretty much had never really been wobbled like he yeah, did. He did get wobbled against Anthony Joshua. And mm -hmm. as you said, one of the best boxers in the world in line for a title opportunity. The, the turnaround that AJ has had since his loss has just been phenomenal, man. The, yeah. the guy is on a tear. He is an absolutely on another level. And to his credit, I think he did say after the fight to Ngannou, don't leave boxing. You know, you can you can keep doing this. But who would he fight? That That is my big yeah. question. Who, which fight makes sense for him um, and the commission? I don't know. I really don't know. But yeah, n next question, Rob. I included this one for you. I have no idea about RimWorld. But um, at Jero NG uh, asks, Rob, what is your favorite RimWorld DLC? Okay. Um, favorite DLC? Probably Royalty. I want to say royalty because when that first dropped, mm. I think it had the biggest impact on the game. I think it changed a lot of mechanics or introduced a lot of mechanics that we just weren't – we just had never had before. We ha It kind of blew our minds in a sense. Yeah. Whereas like the DLC after that just added – like roy royalty – opened our eyes to what could be possible in the realm of DLC, DLC. And then everything that followed, we were kind of like, oh, how good is this? How good is this? But it didn't have the same impact mm. of the, as, as, as that one. And it, if I'm not correct, I'm mistaken, maybe it was the first as well. And I think maybe that played a uh, big role in that. But it's funny, this question comes up, because, especially because you wouldn't know, Rimworld just got announced for a new DLC. Mm. And it's a horror-themed one with like cults and cultists and satanic rituals and cannibals and That's it looks cool. it looks cool. It looks cool. It, I feel like Rimworld's getting to a point where I might be able to do a vanilla playthrough. So I've always – like once you start modding Rimworld, you never really stop. But yeah. I think I might be at a point where I think after that DLC drops, I might just strip it back and just go full vanilla. So I want to ask you honestly, man. Do you know when the DLC comes out? By the way, is it no? Oh, no. I so I'm, I'm going to assume it's probably sometime this year. How the hell are you going to find time to play it between Rimworld Dragon's Dogma Anomaly. Two and Elden Ring uh, DLC Shadow of the Earth Tree and all these other games coming out this year? When are you going to play it? <laughs> it's called Rimworld Anomaly. Nah, you don't, mate. You don't understand. I'm not playing anything except Dragon's Dogma Two right okay. now. Like, you are you are I, fully in, I you're love, invested. I love Rimworld, but dude, it's not even on my radar. If it came out mm. tomorrow, I wouldn't care. Like, same with <laughs> anything else. Like, nothing <laughs> matters right now to me except wrapping up this podcast and jumping back on. 
before training. Are you, are you going to play today? Is that your plan? Well, I was playing it before we started recording. What are you talking about? <laughs> like, well, literally, I was preparing ten, for the podcast. <laughs> literally, literally 10 minutes before, I was like, <laughs> just uh, trying to get back to town before darkness ensued. <laughs> oh, dude, darkness is brutal. Speaking again, I know we've t- talked about it a lot, but those phantoms, man, are the only reason why I don't want to go out at night and travel. Mm. They just constantly oh. kick my ass. Yeah, uh, I don't find them hard to kill. I just find that because I'm I'm playing a warrior, they're fast. So mm. and I'm slow as hell. That's it's that's the only thing annoying me about warriors. That I'm slow as hell. Yeah. So they're fast, pretty quick, and because they're like kind of ethereal looking, wispy looking things, you c- I can't judge the distance, so I mm. always miss, and it takes me like two seconds to swing my damn sword. <laughs> so, so those fights, uh, I just end up, I usually end up taunting everything and just taking a beating while my yeah. um, my Sophia character just lays lightning well, into them. I heard as well that mages take a little bit long to cast their spells as well. So I don't know if going to a mage or a slash a sorcerer is going to help you in that regard. Maybe it will because you can keep distance. I don't know. Well, I don't, yeah. Well, the idea that's drawing me to sorcerer is that in the fights, it gets hectic. Yeah. And I'm, I hate having to run from one end to the other and then swing my big sword and it's so slow and the dude just runs off and I miss and then it just it's just annoying and I don't mm. know how much more damage I'm getting out of it because I haven't got anything to compare. Mm. Whereas like with the sorcerer, if I see some saurians sitting down chilling, I have the time to charge it, to charge like a meteor yeah. or whatever the hell I'm going to do to it. So, so I, why don't you play Magic Archer or something like that? Because I feel like Archer... Really- they're pretty quick and you can shoot them at a distance and probably yeah, best and the worlds. idea the idea there are a lot of different type arrows so I think that yeah. would be like a lot of debilitating arrows and elemental arrows which sounds really cool I mm. do like that idea but I don't know never been much of an archer you know Fair. and the only Fair. thing holding me back from playing sorcerer is that they're nerds right <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I don't want to be I don't want to be wrapped up in a Bed sheet, <laughs> w- wielding a stick. <laughs> <laughs> it does look like a bed sheet, does? <laughs> yeah, man. And like the dude that uh, I create is like beefy, has massive shoulders, uh, yeah. big yeah. legs. And when I wear that bed sheet, I look funny. <laughs> I look funny, dude. Dude. So I, the amount of time that I spent in character creation and like thinking of the cool tattoos and the scars that I could have on my body, yeah. and I'm just wearing clothes on it anyway. I'm like, what was the yeah. point of that? I know the there, tattoos are there, but come on. There is a uh, there is a barber shop. Okay. And you can buy these things of metamorphosis from somewhere in in the main town and you can yep. go to the barber and rearrange yourself. I haven't done it because I haven't earned enough stuff to justify changing anything. Fair. But uh but dude, I'm pumped. <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna go and play Dragon's Dogma 2 after getting this podcast up. Rob, man. I am so keen to go back and play the game, but this has been a good episode, especially after our one year, one year anniversary on the channel. I thought I'd mention it in the episode because it's a pretty cool milestone to hit. Yeah. I didn't even know we had been doing that long. I understand yeah. we had breaks because we're still kind of finding our footing and, and we're only up to episode 35. It's crazy to think that we've been doing this or yeah. at least trying to do this for, for the last year. So yeah. thank you to all the fans and supporters that have subbed and Shout it from your windows to your friends to, mm-hmm. to, to have a listen. You guys are the lift beneath our wings. <laughs> <laughs> we will see you next week, by the way, in episode 36. So thank you for watching and see you then.